Okay, this is the second hour of Physics 1B for September 1st. And uh, before break, I had everyone take a look at this question right here to find out how deep you need to go in a body of water to feel a pressure that's double atmospheric pressure. Let's go ahead, since you've had some time to look at it and try to solve it, let's go ahead and solve it. So the question is, you've got a body of water. You want to know how far down do you need to swim so that this height h is the question so that the pressure at this point so at this level we would say that the pressure is equal to two atmospheres okay now to do that we're going to use this equation right here let's rearrange it like this p minus p naught is equal to rho gh by the way what's on the left hand side here is often referred to as gauge pressure so you're going to have a problem or two where they're going to talk about gauge pressure. All gauge pressure means is you take the pressure minus the atmospheric pressure. So the gauge pressure here would be one atmosphere. It's just P, this, this is gauge pressure, P minus P naught. All right, so pressure, we need that to be two atmospheres, but we really want that to be converted into um, SI units. Now to keep things simple, um, one atmosphere we said before was approximately equal to 1 times 10 to the 5 pascals, right? So I'm just going to use that number. It just makes things a lot easier. So two atmospheres would be 2 times 10 to the 5, right? So on the left-hand side over here, what we would plug in is for P, we'd have 2 times 10 to the 5 pascals minus 1 times 10 to the 5 pascals. Now keep in mind, on mastering physics, they might not they might not be able to let you do this. You may need to actually include more digits, but for, for doing something like this, I think it's totally fine. Oh, and then I skipped a step. My bad. Let's move this down one step so we can fill in. Let's uh, solve for H first before we plug the numbers in. That's what I want to do. So I'll have P minus P naught divided by rho G. That should be equal to H. So we divide this by rho and what's rho again i've already forgotten not really of course but what's rho what is this little p looking thing with the curly it's the density of water basically right or the density of whatever fluid we're talking about yeah density so yeah you're right it's a thousand it's a thousand kilograms per meter cubed multiplied by g which is 9.8 uh, Louis got it right. That's exactly right, Louis. About every 10.3 meters you go down, it's going to increase by one atmosphere. That's correct. Or roughly 10 meters. You plug all these things in here, and you're probably going to get 10. I think you get 10.2 if you do it this way. Let's see. Yeah, this is 10.2. But. You know, if, if you would use the numbers that you guys, you all mentioned, you'd get a slightly larger number. So this is about, I get, let's just call it 10, because we can all agree on 10, right? It's approximately 10. About every 10 meters you go down, which is about 33 feet, uh, the pressure increases by one atmosphere. And this is something that um, people that are like scuba divers have to think about. Is it possible anyone in here is a scuba diver? No? That's fine. Um, anyway, but yeah, it's something they have to think about because you know, as they go deeper and deeper and deeper and they feel these higher and higher pressures, when they start to rise up and they, they come back to the surface, if they do it too quickly, it can burst like capillaries in their eyes and around their eyes and it can give them like black eyes. Looks like they got into a fight or something like that. If they go up too fast, the rapid change in pressure can cause damage. Okay. So we'd also like to do another example problem to kind of drive home this idea of variation of pressure with depth. So let's try this problem. This one's a little tricky. I'm gonna set it up a little bit and then I'm gonna let you all try to solve it yourselves, okay? So I'll put the equations that we need over here on the right. Is that is that writing large enough that you all can see it on your screens? If anybody at all can't read it, just let me know and I'll make it bigger, okay?
So we're going to need that one. Saturation. I don't know what a saturation diver is. You'll have to tell us what that is. Um, we need this equation, and we will also need... What is it? Pressure is equal to force divided by area. Those are the two equations that we'll need. All right, let's read the problem. It says, to estimate the force exerted on your eardrum due to the water when you're swimming at the bottom of a pool that's five meters deep. So we've got a pool. And we got a person that is swimming at the bottom of the pool down here. And they've got an ear. Draw an oversized ear on this person. And we know that the depth of the pool is five meters. We also know it's, it's exposed to the atmospheric pressure, so the pressure at the top up here is going to be atmospheric pressure, P naught. And our question is, what is the net force? What does it say? Where does it say? Estimate the force exerted on your eardrum due to the water when you're swimming at the bottom of a pool that's five meters deep, and it's going to turn out to be net force. But that's going to come from this uh, thing right here. So this says, this example is a substitution problem. The air inside the middle ear is normally at atmospheric pressure P naught. Did you all know that? That the air inside your ears is at atmospheric pressure? Probably shouldn't be too surprising since the air around us is atmospheric pressure. So how did the air get in there? It probably came from the atmosphere. So it's understandable that it would be at atmospheric pressure, right? So let's draw a larger picture of this person and just say, okay, here's, here's one ear, here's the other ear. And what they're saying is that there's an ear canal inside of here. This looks awful. Um, and that inside of the ear canal, there's air in there that's at a pressure of P naught, okay? Now, since this person is submerged in water, the pressure on the outside of the ear is gonna be higher, right? We'll call it P. So, when you have a situation where the pressure on one side is different than the pressure on the other side, then there's going to be kind of a net effect which is that there's gonna be a net force that's acting over here. Now, there's also a force on the inside, but that force on the inside is going to be smaller than the force on the outside, right? Because greater pressure. Now, let's keep reading. The air inside the middle ear is normally at atmospheric pressure P naught. Therefore, to find the net force on the eardrum, we must consider the difference between the total pressure at the bottom of the pool and atmospheric pressure. Let's estimate that the surface area of the eardrum to be approximately one centimeter squared. So there's our area. The area is gonna be one centimeter squared, which is also one times 10 to the negative four meters squared. Okay. I'm gonna ask you another question real quick here, just to, um, just to give you an understanding more about the way this works. Let me turn my light off, because there's no way you're gonna be able to see what I'm about to do. Okay, so let's say that I take an object, okay, just like a, a very simple object, just like a plane, okay? So I have a plane right here, a piece of paper, let's say, a magazine, something like that, right? I'm going to use a book. So, got this object right here, right? And um, let's say this object is placed, uh, just, you're holding it, something like this, you're holding an object, right? In the middle of the air. It's surrounded by air pressure on this side air pressure on this side, air pressure on this side. So only atmospheric pressure is the only thing this object is subject to, okay? So let's say that the cross-sectional area of this side is A and the cross-sectional area of the bottom side is also A, right? That means that the air on top is gonna exert a pressure and a force down on this object. Would you all agree? There's gonna be a total force acting on the top of this object, right? And what will the total force be? The force on the top it's gonna be equal to P naught multiplied by A, right? And if the area is big enough, this could be a pretty big force, right? Keep in mind that uh, P naught is about, you know, 101, 101,300 Pascals, right? So if this object, for example, is a meter cubed, you're talking about a force of about 100,000 Newtons, which is approximately 5,000 pounds. That's really high. Although a meter, a meter squared is pretty big, but huge amount of force basically that's exerted on the top. But if I take an object like this 
and I know that there's air pressure pushing down on the top of it, right? That doesn't add to its weight, right? Does everyone agree with that? It doesn't feel heavier. This is just a tablet. It weighs almost nothing, right? Maybe it weighs about a pound. I don't know. But I don't feel the 25,000 pounds of air pressure that's pushing down on it, right? I don't feel that. And why not? Because the pressure's all around, exactly. That pressure is exerted on the left side, the right side, and the bottom. So you don't feel it. It's just like, you know, it's balancing forces, right? So you've got the exact same force pushing up from the bottom. So the force on the bottom is also equal to P-naught multiplied by A. Now, let's ask a different question. What if I have a really, really clean, polished glass table, okay? So I've got a really nice, clean glass table, right? So I have a glass table. It's a very clean, very polished glass table. Right? Now, let's say that on top of my glass table, I take a piece of glass that's also very polished, very clean, right? So I take a piece of glass and I place it on top of this table, okay? And let's say the piece of glass is very flat on one side, flat enough that it makes really good contact with the, with, the, with the glass table surface, right? So I have another piece of glass that I place on top of this, right? Now, very similar situation, right? Where we could say, well, there's air pressure that pushes down on the glass, right? However, this piece of glass would be really, really hard to pick up off the table. Would you all agree? If you just came up and you try to grab the edges with your hand, like grab both sides with your hand and try to pick it up, it would be incredibly difficult to lift. Have anyone ever experienced something like this? Do you all know what I'm talking about? I've experienced it with metal and metal, like Me uh, very sure. tiny stainless steel. And stainless sure, steel. absolutely. So if you have a stainless steel like countertop or something like that, and you have a, a very clean piece of metal and you put the metal on top, it's the same scenario, right? It's the same idea, right? So what about the, it? Go ahead. Oh, Dave. sorry. Go ahead, please. Go ahead. Like if you have a like a wet glass on like a countertop, absolutely is it the same thing. Exactly you the can't same thing. Lift it. Hundred percent. That's okay. probably an even better example. You've got a, a, a wet piece of glass that's on a countertop. It can be very very difficult to lift it up. So why is that the case? Well, I'll let you think about it, but I'll tell you one thing. This piece of glass, much like this object right here, is feeling pressure on the top right? Lots of pressure from air pressure is coming down on the top, right? So you've got air pressure, it pushes down on the top, right? And of course, you've also got air pressure pushing from the bottom, but there's a glass table in between. So the air can't as easily sneak under here, right? The whole point of it being glass on glass and everything being really polished is if it makes really, really solid contact, which is the same thing that would happen, as you said, if you had a piece of glass that was kind of wet and it was on a on in almost any kind of like a countertop or something like that, it's gonna be very difficult to pick it up. And that's because the force that's acting on the bottom doesn't have another force acting on the, sorry, the force that's acting on the top doesn't have the force on the bottom to counterbalance it. And so as a result, when you're trying to lift this glass off the table, you're literally, you're literally trying to lift like thousands of pounds of pressure. Does that make sense? And the main reason is because air can't make its way into the bottom if it's sealed off right here. Now, there is an easy way to lift it up though, right? How would you lift it up? Jacob, if, if you if you have that, you had that experience of a piece of glass that was I kind did. of, go ahead. Right at the end of the table and uh, yeah. let it go. You know. 100%. That's what I do. 100%, that's exactly what you do. And the interesting thing is you don't need to know anything about physics to do that, right? You just kind of know, right? You just kind of know that if you slide this to the edge, and you can get your hand underneath it, it's really easy to lift up. All of a sudden, that apparent force that was sticking it to the, the surface uh, is gone. The moment that even a little bit of the edge comes to the edge of the surface, you can just lift it up easy, right? So, yeah. Uh, that's what this problem is about. And this is also how suction cups work, right? Suction cups are designed so that they evacuate the air out of the, the part where they where they touch. Maybe a better example is a plunger, even though it's maybe a little bit gross. Plungers work in the same way. They create a kind of seal that will uh, that will allow you to um, stick to objects, right? So suction cups work in this way. These are also things I'm going to show you when we go to campus. But I thought that probably people had this experience and we might as well talk about it. So, um, go ahead. 
I had a question. Um, can't w w can't wouldn't the uh, atmosphere, the force from it, break? Couldn't it break the material? Or, well, because the the force from the atmosphere is even, right? It's smooth and it's all around, and um, because there's a support from below to prevent that force from puncturing it, I don't think it would break. Okay. Okay. But maybe in certain situations usually when something breaks it's either because it's holding an excessive amount of weight or because it feels any, a sudden increase in the amount of force right you could break a piece of glass pretty easily by just hitting it hard enough even with a very blunt object right so I think that's why that's a really good question though it's definitely not obvious I think that the, the last table from below is supporting it and preventing it from breaking I think is maybe the simplest answer, but I'd have to think more about that. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, getting back to this problem. So, why don't you all try to solve this problem? Understanding that it's all about the difference in pressure. See if you can figure out the answer to this problem. Estimate the force exerted on your eardrum due to the water when you're swimming at the bottom of a pool that's five meters deep. Keeping in mind that the air inside the ear, right, is at atmospheric pressure, p naught. The pressure outside the ear is going to be P. We can use that equation, variation of pressure with depth, because we have a height, and we have a density because it's water. We have gravity, and we have P naught. So we can find P, right? So see if you can't figure out um, the net force on the eardrum. And I'll give you a few minutes. This is pretty tricky. But maybe with that setup, it'll help you all to, uh, to figure it out. So take... Um, I'll start off with like four minutes and then I'll check to see how you're all doing. And if you need more time, I'll give you more time. Oh, and if you do get an answer, just wait. Don't put the answer in the chat. W wait until I ask for it. That way, a lot of people to kind of think it through.
Okay, that was probably about five minutes. A little less, probably. Does anyone have an answer yet? It's okay if it's wrong, but by trying to do these things during class, it'll really help you to, to develop an understanding. Because, uh, oh, look at this. You guys all got it right. That's great. That's really good. Good job. That's the right answer. Okay, if, you, if that's not what you got, that's okay. This problem's really tricky. No one in my other class got it right, so... <laughs> the fact that anyone in this class did, that's, that's really good. So it's a little tricky, because, uh, let's talk about how we solve it. Um, I don't know specifically what you all did. There's lots of ways to do this. I'll, I'll just show you what I, what I would do. So we know that the pressure on the inside of the ear is P0, and we know that the pressure on the outside of the ear is P, right? So we can turn those into forces. And we can say the force on the outside of the ear is going to be PA, and the force on the inside of the ear is going to be smaller, and it's going to be P0 times A. Right? And the net force is going to be the difference between the two of them. I'll take the larger one, which is PA, minus the smaller one, which is P0A. And then we have A in both of these terms, right? So you do P minus P0 times A. But hey, P minus P naught, well, according to this equation, that's equal to rho GH. That gives us the difference in pressure, also known as the gauge pressure, multiplied by the area. And now we have all of the symbols that we need uh, to solve this. We just plug in net force is equal to rho, which is 1,000, density of water, multiplied by G, which is 9.8, multiplied by A, which is one times 10 to the negative four. That's a four. Fours always get turned into that weird kind of thing on this. And you can see if you multiply this, oh, and I missed one H times five meters. It's basically a thousand times 10, which is 10,000. And this is one over 10,000, so they kind of cancel out. And you get about five, or as you all said, 4.9 newtons. And that is the net force. That's not a big number, right? I believe that is approximately one point something pounds. This five over four. This is about 1.25 pounds, I believe. Not much. That being said, if you were to go down to the bottom of a five meter, how many feet is five meters? It's like roughly 15, a little bit more, right? Have you ever been in a pool that's 15 feet deep? Most pools are not that deep, right? At least I don't think they are. Uh, if you just go down to the bottom of like a six foot deep pool, you'll definitely feel this. And even and then that, that would only be a third the force, right? Because the force scales with the, the height. Anyway, so I hope this helps you to understand why it is that you feel these pain in your ear when you're going down to the bottom of water or the same thing happens, as I said, when you, when you get in an airplane and, and fly up or when you... Um, uh, drive up a mountain or something like that and you hear any of those situations where you feel your ears pop or you need to pop your ears that's really what's happening do you all know what happens when you pop when you quote pop your ears like when you yawn and you all know what's happening are you releasing pressure yeah you're either releasing or taking it in one of the two right depending on which is higher right but yeah it equalizes the pressure exactly that's right you release the pressure equalize the pressure that's exactly right all right, so uh, we have a little bit more time left. Do we go to 8.30 in this class? Is that right? Or is it 8.35? 8.35, I think. 8.35, okay. So we got about right, 30 minutes. So I'm going to briefly mention what Pascal's Law is. We will try to do a problem with that. And I will do my best to see if in this time we can also get to talking about um, buoyancy. Ah, this part first. Okay, Pascal's Law. I always thought about this as being called Pascal's Principle, but it doesn't really matter what you call it. So, um, instead of reading what that says, let me draw a picture first, and then we will talk about what it means. So suppose that I have a container, and instead of filling it with water, let's fill it with gas. And let's fix it, let's fit this container with a movable piston. Yeah, you all will be seeing a lot of problems in this class of movable pistons. So just so we understand what that is, piston is going to be an object that sits on top of um, this fluid right here and pushes down until the fluid pushes back hard enough so that it comes to rest. 
and then we're going to have a movable piston, so we're going to have kind of a, an arm that we can push down on here, uh, or pull up on, push down or pull up, to affect what's happening inside of this container right here, okay? Now, suppose that, um, uh, suppose that we want to increase the pressure of the air inside of this container, and we have this piston. What can we do to increase the pressure of the air inside, inside of the piston? Oh, sorry, inside of the container. Push it reduce down. Reduce the volume. Just, yeah, push down and thereby doing reduce the volume, right? So if you push down on this, air, unlike water, if you were to try to do this with water, it'd be really hard to push down on it because water can't really compress very well. But gases can compress very well, right? So if you push down here, it will increase the pressure inside of here. Now let's read what Pascal's Law says and let's see if we can apply it to this scenario. Pascal's Law says that pressure applied to an enclosed fluid, this would be your enclosed fluid, right? Air is a fluid. Pressure applied to an enclosed fluid is transmitted undiminished to every portion of the fluid and the walls of the containing vessel. So what that means is that if I were to increase the pressure on the outside, right? it would increase the pressure everywhere on the inside. And you're right, Louis, that this is the principle behind how a hydraulic fluid works. And we'll look at, we're gonna look at a hydro, hydraulic press here in a second as an example of this. So, um, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put this side by side and let's think about the, how this is pretty much the same thing as this equation, right? Now we said that if you have a, a fluid that's open to the, uh, open to the surface, right? that uh, you know, if, if the pressure out here is one atmosphere, then that's what you're gonna plug in for P naught, right? Well, what if the pressure is more than one atmosphere? And how could it be more than one atmosphere? Well, by pushing down on this piston, you increase the amount of pressure that you have at the top, right? And by increasing the pressure at the top, you also increase the pressure within the, within the fluid itself. And that's basically what Pascal's Law says. But what's really powerful about this is you can design a system where when you push down here, that pressure change that you've created gets communicated to an entirely different piston. Okay, we can set up two pistons. And by doing so, we can use them to create what's called a mechanical advantage. So this is, this is an example of how Pascal's principle can be used. Does anyone have any questions about what Pascal's principle says? Pretty much just says, when you push on the top of a fluid, it's gonna increase, increase the pressure inside the fluid. But what it says more is that that's transmitted undiminished to every portion of the fluid and to the walls. And that's what's gonna be important for the way that a hydraulic press works. Gotcha. So pictured here is a very crude diagram of what a hydraulic press does. So on the left, we have a movable piston here that has an area A1. On the right, we have a movable piston that has an area A2, and I think it's pretty, clear from the picture, even though it's not three-dimensional, that A2 is supposed to be bigger than A1. Now, sitting on top of the other piston is a car. So a car probably weighs a lot, right? And on the right, I'm sorry, on the left-hand side, we just have a force that's pushing down here. Now, the idea is that the initial position of this system was with the piston starting down here, okay, and the other piston starting right up here, right? So that th these were the initial positions of the pistons here like this. And by pushing down on the left side, this is our fluid, right? By pushing down on the left side, right? Pascal's principle says, or Pascal's law says, that whatever force that we push down on this is gonna create an increase in pressure, right? And the amount that we're gonna increase the pressure by, well, we can just look at the definition of pressure. It's gonna be F1 divided by A1, right? So if we increase the pressure on this side, the same pressure increase has to happen over here. It's almost like a conservation, it's not a conservation law, but it's almost like conservation of fluid pressure in a weird way. It's like if the pressure goes up on this side of the fluid, well, this side of the fluid has to go up too because it's a fluid, you know? So that means that the same pressure has to be felt inside of here. So P is kind of the pressure of the, um, it's not the pressure, it's the increase in pressure, honestly. It's the increase, in, it's the added pressure that we're putting in here. But Pascal's Law say it has to be the same to all portions. So we can say on the right-hand side over here that that same pressure is going to create an upward force on this side, F2, that should be divided by 
the area on this side, which is a2, right? Now, if we if we rearrange this equation, right, to get an idea of what this means, so if I write it like this, f1 is equal to, um, let's move a1 onto this side, so it says a1 divided by a2, okay, um, multiplied by f2. All right, now, let's pick some numbers for this. So let's say that a1 uh, is equal to um, two meters squared, okay? And let's say that a2 is equal to 10 meters squared, all right? And let's say that we're trying to lift a car, and let's say that the weight of our car that we're trying to lift right here, the weight, W, let's say the weight of our car is, I don't know, let's say 1,000 pounds. That's a nice round number, right? 1,000 pounds. How much force do I need to exert upwards on a car that weighs a thousand pounds to make it start moving up? What's the minimum force I need to make it move upwards? If it weighs a thousand pounds. Is it a thousand and one pounds? Is it a thousand pounds? Is it 999 pounds? What do you think? Anything above a thousand pounds? Yeah. Anything equal to a thousand pounds will work, because once you have an upward force of a thousand pounds, you can start lifting it up, right? So what that means is that in order for this object to be lifted, F2 needs to be at least equal to a thousand pounds, right? So we'll put F2 is equal to the weight, which is equal to a thousand pounds. Kind of running off the screen there. Yeah, F2, not F1, that's right. So now let's figure out what F1 ends up being in this case. So now F1 ends up being equal to, we take A1, which was two uh, meters squared, divide by A2, which is 10, and then we multiply by F2, which is 1,000 pounds. And so we basically get 1,000 divided by 10, which is 100, times two is 200. So that means that with a force of only 200 pounds, you could lift a car. What that would mean is that, uh, I mean, I personally could stand on the left-hand side of this and it would lift a car up, basically. Or it would lift a car of a thousand pounds up, assuming that we give it these parameters, right? So that's pretty powerful, right? We call that mechanical advantage. Um, have you all ever seen anything like this in, in our physics classes before, or maybe outside of the physics classes? Can you think of anything else that works like this? Where you can take a smaller force and lift a larger object? Yeah, hand jack. Something like plumbing. I think I've seen something like a pipe. What'd you say, David? I've seen something similar like this, like in piping, like in plumbing. Yeah, probably so. Absolutely. And then, as Elias is saying, leverage. Leverage is another good example. If you've got a long enough lever, you can you can lift up a boulder, right? You can, yeah. Hand jack and lift a car. Compound pulleys. Yep. Multiple pulleys do the exact same thing, right? If I've got two pulleys, and they're they're done in the right way. You can lift an object uh, by only applying a force that's half of its weight. So if the object's 10 pounds, you only need to apply a force of five pounds. If you've got like four pulleys, it's even crazier. You can you can have an object that's like 64 pounds, and if you've got four pulleys, I think you can lift it with uh, a force of two pounds, okay? So all of these are examples of simple machines that, uh, you know, levers, pulleys, that can be used to give you a mechanical advantage. And this is an example of how you can use air pressure and a hydro hydraulic fluid to do the exact same thing, okay? I just have to ask you all, do you want to do this problem or do you wanna move on to, nah, let's just do this problem. I don't wanna, eh, kind of already did it. Yeah, I don't. I think we'll be okay if we skip this. I want to move on to buoyancy. So that's Pascal's law. We'll see it show up from time to time in this class. Um, and uh, yeah, pretty important idea. Pretty neat that you can uh, that you can lift objects by just employing the uh, the way that fluids work. All right. So next is Archimedes' principle, very useful idea. 
and this is related to the topic of buoyancy. So, now the question is, why do things float? Why do things float and, um, you know, why do some things sink and why do some things kind of do neither? So, in order to do this, we are going to do something we've basically already done, um, but we're going to tweak it a little bit. So, we're going to start off with a container of a fluid. Come on. Let me pick this. So we got a container, and within this container, we are gonna put an object, and let's say the object that we put in here is a piece of wood. So here's our piece of wood. It's gonna be like a cylinder again. This will be very similar to the variation of pressure with depth derivation that we did, but we're gonna focus just upon the force of buoyancy. So, I have a piece of wood. Now, wood doesn't normally float. It kind of looks like a log. Um, or sorry, wood doesn't normally sink or stay still in water, so we're going to have to add some caveats to this. So, cross-sectional area A on top, cross-sectional area A on bottom, a height H, although I don't know that the height ends up mattering in this particular version of the problem. And what we're going to do is we're going to take this piece of wood and we're going to push it underneath the water. Okay? Now, if we push a piece of wood underneath the water, it's going to tend to want to float back to the top, obviously, right? But what we're going to do is we're just going to say, well, can we do something similar to what we did earlier? I don't want to add anything to the picture. Let's just have a piece of wood. We're going to push it down underneath the water so that it's submerged. And then we're going to stop time so that it doesn't move up. And we're just going to look at the forces acting on this piece of wood at a moment in time before it starts to move up. And then the next thing we'll do is talk about what happens after it starts to move, okay? We'll calculate its acceleration, basically. So at a moment in time, we want to analyze the forces acting on this piece of wood when it's submerged in water. What are the forces that are going to be acting on this piece of wood? What will they be? Gravity, weight, yeah, okay. So there's going to be a force, I'll put it kind of off to the side here. That's the weight, right? And then what else is there? There's going to be some pressure, right? Yep, yeah, just as you're saying. So let's say that the pressure is coming up from the bottom down here. And then the pressure is also going to exert a force on top here. Remember, and I'm being a little bit bad about this. Remember, the pressure itself isn't a force, right? It's the pressure times the area that gives you the force. But let's go ahead and say the pressure at the top here is P1. Let's say the pressure at the bottom right here is P2, right? That means that the force that gets pushed down on the top is equal to P1A, right? And the force acting from the bottom will be P2A. Everybody agree with that? Okay. Now, the net effect of these two pressures is gonna create a force that we call buoyancy, all right? And in order to understand those, that, what we can say in general is that if we think of our, our piece of wood right here, it's really subject to just two forces in a, in a more simple way. It's subject to a weight that points down, and it's subject to a buoyant force that points up. Now, which of these is going to be bigger, the buoyant force or the weight? The buoyant force is basically just the floating force, if you don't understand what I'm saying there. Yeah, the buoyant force. And how do you know it has to be bigger? How do we know that B is greater than W in this case? Because it's going to come back up. Yeah, because we know wood floats. Yeah, exactly. 100%. Wood floats. It's going to come back up. Exactly. So where is that buoyant force coming from then? Well, it must be coming from these two other forces right here, right? It must be coming from these two other forces right here, right? So what I would say is that um, the buoyant force B has to be the same thing as the difference between the pressure acting on the bottom and the pressure acting on the top. P2A minus P1A.
But if we go into more detail with this and we rearrange it to write it like this, P2 minus P1 multiplied by A, we can take P2 and P1 and say, wait a minute, we had a formula for what that's equal to, right? What was P1, P2 minus P1 equal to? If I go down to the, it's height H, so that's rho GH, exactly. From our variation of pressure with depth equation, that's rho GH, so let's plug that in here. And then say, okay, wait a minute, what's H times A again? That was volume. That's the volume of our object now. So I'm gonna write this as volume with an O to represent the volume of the object, okay? Uh, you'll see why that matters here. Maybe not tonight, but definitely next week. So now our equation becomes B is equal to rho multiplied by the volume of the object multiplied by G. Now the rho right here, there's technically two densities now in this problem, if you think about it, right? Wood has a density, right? And water has a density. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write here, just so that it's 100% clear, that our definition of our buoyant force is going to be rho F, and I'll just say over here to the side that rho F is going to be density of the fluid. And I mention this because in the future, we will need to uh, distinguish because we're gonna have density of fluid and then density of object. We're also gonna have volume of fluid and volume of object. So this is, uh, this is the definition of what the buoyant force is when an object is fully submerged, okay? It has to be completely underwater. And if it's completely underwater, the buoyant force is equal to the density of the fluid times the volume of the object multiplied by gravity, or put in a much more eloquent way by, by Archimedes, when a body is completely or partially immersed in a fluid, the fluid exerts an upward force on the body equal to the weight of the fluid displaced by the body. Fluid displaced by the body. What does that mean? Fluid displaced by the body. When I take a piece of wood and I push it into the water, what happens to the water level? Does it go down? Does it go up? Does it stay the same? It goes up. It goes up, right? So you could say, in a way, you've kind of pushed aside or displaced some of the water, right? And the amount of water that you've displaced? Well, how much water did you displace? Well, it's fully submerged. So you displaced an amount of water equal to the volume of the wood, right? That makes sense? The amount of water you've displaced is equal to the volume of the object because, again, we're fully submerged right now, right? And so can you see the connection between Archimedes' principle and this equation? Because it says the fluid exerts an upward force on the body equal to the weight of the fluid displaced by the body. Well, where's weight in this equation? I don't see any weight in this equation. Where's the weight? It's, it's actually there, it's just kind of hidden. Well, gravity, that's definitely part of weight, so we've got half of it. So what do we need, what are we missing? We're missing the mass part, right? Where's the mass? This goes back to the very first thing we talked about today. Uh, the density, right? Uh, Louis, right? Uh, yeah. Density is equal to mass over volume. So technically, rho F times V naught is basically equal to the mass of the water that's been displaced, right? That's the mass of the water. Even though it's the volume of the object, well, what Archimedes says, it's the volume of the weight of the fluid displaced by the body. Now just think about it. I think this is a really neat idea. If you think about it, and Archimedes is old. I mean, he's, he's, we're talking like, this is thousands of years ago he came up with this idea, and we still have it in your textbook today. That's pretty impressive. You gotta give him credit for coming up with an idea way, way, way long ago that is still, you know, written down in textbooks today. Because I mean, our textbooks don't include a lot of the physics that was taught by Aristotle, you know what I mean? We mostly start with Newtonian physics, right? Because the Aristotle physics is not very useful to you. <laughs> it's not, it's not going to point you in the right direction. You know what I mean? But Archimedes had this figured out. He's an ancient Greek. And um, it's pretty neat. The idea is just really simple. It's like the buoyant force is just equal to how much water you've actually displaced. And you'll do a lab where you get to see this. I don't know. I, I find that it's, it's, just, it's, a, it's just an elegantly simple solution to what buoyancy is, you know? It's like you, you've displaced some water. 
and that water is exerting a force that pushes back up on you. So I think that's really neat. Um, okay, so how much time do we have left? We have very little time left. Might be able to do this problem? I think we can. All right, all right, let's do this. This is good. Okay, so um, we're gonna do a little uh, quick quiz, I think they call these. So, given what we just learned, let's see if I can keep all this on the same screen here. Okay, let's say we take a container, right? We take a container. And within this container, we're going to place two balls. We're gonna put a bowling ball and a beach ball in the container, right? And, a, and just like the ball, there's, there's fluid here. There's, this, this is all water, okay? So we take a bowling ball, we put a bowling ball in the water. What's gonna happen to it? It's gonna fall to the ground, right? It's just gonna hit the bottom, right? So here's our bowling ball. In fact, let's make it, let's make it darker or something to just distinguish it from a beach ball. So here's our bowling ball. Now, we take a beach ball that has exactly the same shape, okay? It's spherical, right? And we place the beach ball into this water. But beach balls will not stay underneath the water, and we've only learned about full submersion, so we've got we to add something to this. So we take a rope and we tie a beach ball, which is kind of something brighter for the beach ball. We tie the beach ball here um, to, uh, to the bottom of the, of the pool. So this is our beach ball. And by beach ball, I mean a inflatable ball that you fill up with air, basically, right? And so here's the question. I'll make it larger so you can actually read this too. Hopefully that's legible and readable. The question is, which experiences the larger buoyant force? And again, let me set this up so that you understand completely what's going on here. They both have exactly the same shape, okay? They have the same diameter, and they're both spheres. Same shape, same diameter, right? Which experiences a larger buoyant force? Don't answer immediately, just give it a second. Is it the beach ball, the bowling ball? Is it neither, they experience the same voice of voice, or is it D, there's not enough information? I want everyone to just think about it for a moment and put your answer in the chat. You can take your time, no rush. Um, I'm not going to tell you the volume. I'm just telling you that they're both spheres and they have the same diameter. You can take that to mean what you... They're the same size, basically. They're the same size. And again, this little line here is just that the we're tying the beach ball down to the bottom because otherwise it'll float up. All right, go ahead and take a guess. You know, I, don't be afraid. Hundred percent okay to get these things wrong. Again, the whole point of doing these kind of active questions and interacting with you in this way is to uh, is to really get you to think about this stuff. And and by actively thinking about it, it'll help you to learn. Getting different answers, which I really like. seeing a lot of C's, B's, and also A. Yeah, please, there's nothing to be afraid of. This isn't for a grade, this is just to help you learn. Go ahead and take a guess. Even if you're just taking a random guess because you don't know the answer. Just take a guess, put it in the chat. This is the last thing we're doing. I'll end class as soon as you all put some answers in here, but. As it is, not everybody's answered yet. All right, there we go. Getting some more answers. I should be nice. Maybe you all are thinking. I'll give you some time.
Okay, last chance. Put an answer in the chat. Okay, the, the majority, I'll just go ahead and we'll stop right there because we gotta go. Um, it looks like the majority of people answered C, which is correct. Most people usually get this one wrong. Most people usually get this one wrong. And in fact, I'm really surprised only one person said beach ball. Uh, no offense to that person. I, I think I would pick beach ball if I was in your shoes. I would just look at this and be like, well, of course, it's the beach ball. Look, it's like almost floating. <laughs> but you're at, you're all right. The answer is neither. They experience the same buoyant force. And what's the reason why? Because the volume of each object is exactly the same. And they're both in the same fluid. And gravity is the same. So even though the bowling ball is much, much denser than the beach ball, and the bowling ball naturally sinks, that doesn't mean it doesn't experience a buoyant force, right? Have you ever tried to lift something underwater? It can be kind of yeah. it can be kind of difficult because you're you're kind of pushing up water. But if you were to go try to pick a bowling ball up underneath the water, it would actually feel lighter. If you actually legitimately tried, you know, felt it and hold it in your hand underneath the water. It would feel a little bit lighter because it experiences literally the exact same buoyant force as the beach ball. What is it that makes the beach ball float, but makes the bowling ball not float, though? It's lighter, so the buoyant force is stronger than the, the weight of the ball. That's exactly right. Yep, yeah, that's exactly right. In the case of the bowling ball, the weight is larger than the buoyant force. Doesn't mean there's not a buoyant force. The weight is just larger. And in the case of the beach ball... Well, the weight is smaller than the buoyant force. So this floats and that sinks. And we'll talk about floating, sinking, partial submersion, and glaciers next time. And try to answer the question about the, you know, why it is that when you see an iceberg, do you only see the tip of the iceberg? Um, and then beyond that, we're going to go into talking about uh, fluid dynamics, I believe. Right? That'll be the next topic. Yeah, buoyancy. Oh, we'll talk about pressure gauges. And then we'll talk about fluid dynamics, about how fluids flow. You know, and uh, and that's that. So we're out of time. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. We don't have class on Monday because of Labor Day, so uh, I guess I will see you all same time next week, 6:30 on Wednesday night, and we will continue. And then the week after that, we'll get our labs going and get on with the course. Um, if anybody has any questions about anything, I'll stick around. Probably not gonna stick around very long because uh, my day started at like uh, 9 a.m. today. So it's a long day of teaching on Wednesdays, but I will stick around because I'm sure you all have some have some questions. Yes, Kate. Uh, do you need Master in Physics due this weekend? No, I don't think it's due this weekend. I think it's due. Kate, yes, we are going to do that. That'll be what we're doing. That'll be what we're doing when we come back. Yeah, I think the first Master in Physics is due like on the 13th. That sounds correct. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. You you should be able to do some of the problems now too, so you might as well go and get started. Yeah, I hope you all enjoy your long weekend and the rest of your week and all of that. So, see you later. I'm sticking around. I'm just going to turn off the video.